your li- You're listening to Kayak Flyer with your host, Sean. Tonight, we're brought to you by Tennessee Trailers, OutdoorAdventureTrailers.com. Simply the best way to get your kayak to and from the water. Bajuco Flats Fly Co. Simply the best custom-made fly rods on the market. Always built to order just the way you want it. Find Bajuco Flats Fly Co. on Instagram and Facebook. Stoneflynets.com, made 100% in the great state of Arkansas with your choice of woods or burls. Stonefly Nets can even be customized for that favorite fisher person in your life. Check out Stoneflynets.com for details. Cutthroatfurledleaders.com, the only leaders that I fish with. Cutthroat furled leaders are excellent for saltwater, freshwater, trout, bass, you name it, you can catch it with a cutthroat furled leader. Head to cutthroatfurledleaders.com, promo code kayak to save 15%. Boys and girls, I do know what do have do not know what happened. Let me spit that out. I'm 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 in a matter of awe and shock because Adam is here twice. In two weeks, Adam, what, did you find no fishing water anywhere that you managed to come back? I know. I, I really have tried to pull out every excuse out of the book to avoid you tonight, Sean, but I'm <laughs> officially out. So I said, forget it. I'm back, baby. Let's do this two weeks in a row. <laughs> yeah. You know, Adam's been MIA half the summer and he's like, man, I can't make the podcast tonight. My kids have baseball. And then I look on Instagram and he's holding trout, <laughs> you know? So that's right. <laughs> we've got a really, a really interesting guest tonight. Um, we got a hold of, uh, you guys all know Dan Frazier. He's been on the show a couple of times, great guy and a great carp fisherman. And, uh, he suggested we bring Trevor on and Trevor's an old school, uh, tr- uh carp fisherman, but he's also the owner of 3d fly reels.com. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk a lot about fishing. So Trevor, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. It'll be fun. <laughs> you didn't know what you signed up for. <laughs> <It's not there. laughs> I'll be okay. It's going to be good. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, um, Dan obviously knows you from carp fishing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things he, he mentioned whenever I was speaking with him, he said, oh, you need to get need to get Trevor on, need to get Trevor on. Uh, first, let's, let's go over some of the 3D reels a little bit, because as a kayak and fly fishing program, the 3D reel does one thing that no other reel does, sure. and that's that it floats, and that that's big. Right. So, you know, I don't know if anybody realizes it, but without a reel attached, your rod floats just fine. Um, it's yeah. got that cork handle. It's hollow, and it'll it'll float like a bobber. When you attach an aluminum reel to it, that aluminum reel will drag it down. And I don't know about you guys. If you guys have been doing the kayak scene for a while, I I, I use a sup for a lot of my fishing. And about four or five years ago, I dropped a $600 reel and $200 rod over the side. Didn't know it. Went paddling for a while, and uh, I was gone forever, right? It was a Billy Pate reel, and I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's almost kind of a, it's almost kind of a sacred reel, right? This is a, a very yeah. special reel, right? So I'm, I'm sure it happens to a lot of people. I've already had one customer who... He was up on the polling platform and his buddy was rolling, running the trolling motor and his buddy decided, I don't know if he wanted to be funny or if it was an accident, but took a hard left and he went off the back of the polling platform with his rod into deep water. And it was kind of nice. He just said he just drew the rod away from him, went over backwards and was able to, you know, kind of swim over and grab the rod a little while later. Um, but like I said, your your rod, it floats on its own. You attach an aluminum reel to it, and that'll drag it down. But with 3D printing, um, the way to make a real stiff and strong 3D printed anything is to make it thick, really thick, but hollow. And when you 3D print, it's natural that the inside is very uh, sparse and hollow, and there's kind of a lattice work on the inside of the 3D printed structure. And that floats. And the reel itself because it's got some metal pieces in there, it doesn't quite float on its own, but once you attach it to a rod, it floats just perfectly, right? So it's kind of cool in a couple ways it comes in handy. If you're, you know, kind of, um, if you're fishing in the flats and you want to unhook a fish and you don't want to deal with your rod and you don't want it to sink to the bottom and lose it, you can just kind of throw it to the side and it floats there. But also if you're out on a boat, you're out on a kayak or a sup, uh, it kind of, 
kind of brings that level, added level of security that it's not going to go bye bye if it drops over, you know. So I've heard about like a lot of guys yeah. in particular who client hooks a fish and gets excited or intimidated or whatever, and poof, there goes the rod. It's gone, right? <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting feature. <laughs> Yeah, I know um, one of my friends that spin fishes, he doesn't always do the best job with the paddle leash or the rod leash. Mm -hmm. And I've started keeping a magnet on my kayak. And I think I've found two or three of his rods that he's dumped the kayak. Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> and so managed to find something on that reel that was magnetic enough to hold mm -hmm. on to. Um, but I have watched several of my friends lose very expensive setups. Oh, because yeah. they just weren't le and leashing a fly rod is is a pain in the butt total pain in the butt and you, you know you land a fish i mean this is one of the scenarios where this is going to happen you land a fish it's utter chaos sometimes especially a big fish right mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have landed you know big old carp or or a drum or anything off your kayak it is a very chaotic experience and yeah. it's pretty easy for you to go over your rod to go over for everything to go south in that situation right so, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The the big, I've caught a couple of big drum, and you know it's it's a nightmare because you're trying to maintain your line, you're trying not to get hooked. You've probably got some other clutter on the floor of your kayak, yeah. and you know you're, you're thinking, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not like catching a small, you know, twelve right. or sixteen inch smallmouth that you can maneuver and keep in the net. I mean, you've got this big, you know. 15 20 pound fish and mm -hmm. and it's it's total chaos there on the boat or the kayak or, or like you said the stand-up paddle board anything and so yeah that that is nuts adam i know you're just now kayak fishing you know have you hopefully you haven't lost anything yet but have you how have you been strapping stuff down yeah i haven't lost anything yet knock on wood but it's definitely a chaotic scene you're right and it, it, it can get that way in a hurry you know you go from the net to holding on to your rod to spinning around in your seat but then feeling all wobbly and um but no i haven't lost anything yet I, you know i'm i'm curious trevor i'm assuming you've had a lot of expertise and a lot of experience with the 3d printing outside of the these reels but you know, did you go into this with the intention of knowing, you know, that lattice structure, as you mentioned, the interior of those reels, knowing, hey, this is going to be a huge upside because it should be buoyant simply because of the way that these print? Or was that kind of a byproduct where you're like, oh, wow. oh, was it an accident? <laughs> yeah. It was an accident, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I was out fishing the flats for a carp and dropped my rod in the water and that's unusual. What's that doing? Right. You know? <laughs> um, but that's right about at the time that I started to figure, you know, at first I was just doing it for myself and for fun and to see if this is something I could do because, um, you know, a couple of years ago I looked into it and there was one fly reel that you could buy that was 3d printed on the market. And that was still the case even just months ago, but it was like a toy, right? You maybe could catch trout on it, more of like a line minder for a two to three weight reel than anything else. And um, so I went into just kind of a challenge myself to say, can I make something I can catch carp on? Because in my world, if it can't catch carp, it's crap, right? I don't care. I'm uninterested, right? <laughs> um, and uh, it, after, you know, started to really be good at catching carp and I could do some unique things with it and I figured out it could float and, that was kind of about the time I started to say, hey, maybe other people might like this thing, you know, might be interested. So, yep. But it was purely accidental. <laughs> That's too good. That's too good. Yeah. I, 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 I would not have bet that. I, I very much would have put money on the fact that you would have said, no, that was the intention from the beginning. Yep. So it's kind of nice to hear that story. Like, absolutely not. It was trial by fire and to some degree with that. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of interesting developments in the world are by accident. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of unintentionality to inventing. I'm not going to say this is some kind of noble invention or anything. It's a plastic fly reel for catching fish, right? But uh, but a lot of the noble things that you do experience in your life that are inventions that really make a difference in our lives, a lot of them are accidents where somebody was just tinkering around and trying to do something and accidentally did something else and said wow that 
that's pretty cool. You know, that could make a difference, right? Yeah, like Silly Putty or, or the Atom Bomb. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are all the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so 3D printing, though, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can 3D print. Um, I probably shouldn't say this, but um, I had a guy I used to work with had a 3D printer, and um, I had a set of the, um, oh, uh, Adam, help me out, uh, uh, River Road Creations, oh, the, the poppers. Oh. The popper oh. jig. Oh. And I took it to him, and I'm like, you know, could you make this? And the next day he brought me one that was 3d printed and it's really an, an exact replica. Wow. And I don't, I don't know if the price would be cheaper than, you know, just buying them. Uh, of course we would do want to, you know, help out our friend, but you know, this was a, a little 3d printed thing. This is the first and only thing I've ever had that somebody 3d printed. And I was just like, wow, I just, it blew me away. What can be done with it? And I'm getting to see more and more people that are using the 3d printers. Um, was it just, I mean, it, you, were you using a lot of 3d printers before you started? Yeah, I've been playing with it for about five or six years now. I had another invention that was quite a bit crazier than this that I was working on maybe six years ago. And I was actually working on it with Dan a little bit. And it was a camera that would sit on your head like a GoPro, but they would auto level. So that, you know, oh. you would be uh, like I could dribble a basketball and go jump and slam a basketball and the whole thing would be super smooth because the camera would auto level. So I got the 3D printer to, to try and make that. And it turned out to be not commercial, but it kind of got me started. But what I learned is, is that 3D printing is really cool and that it kind of democratizes production. In that. Really with, you know, enough time spent with the machine to learn how to deal with it and learn how to tune it and everything. Really anybody can start making stuff in their garage. And, and even, you know, if you're willing to get enough printers, you can make stuff at a fair amount of volume. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to make money at it. it, it it's, good, it's hard necessarily to make money with 3D printing because, you know, plastic, if you get stuff that's molded out of plastic, you can make those for pennies. Right. And right. Like thousands of them. Right. But it right. takes 10, 20, 30, 50, a hundred thousand dollars to make the molds. 3D printing, the investment is relatively cheap to get into kind of a production mode where you can make something. So what it really does is, is it spreads out the capability for people to do small scale production in their garage. And the other thing it does is it really spreads out the creativity. Right. If you can imagine it and you can draw it in a computer, you can make it with a 3D printer. You might have to kind of adjust some of the parameters and what it looks like, but it's really limitless in the amount of creativity that you can show. It's a lot of fun. Really cool. Yeah. That's one of the things I always thought. I, I see all this stuff that people 3D print and I'm sitting here going, but what's that application look like at the yeah. end? You know, is it, or are we just making, you know, paperweights? What are we doing? And, and this is one of the examples where it's something that's really cool. And, and as an engineer, I mean, designing this probably wasn't the most complicated part. Oh, it was horribly complicated. Um, <laughs> And it was really hard, actually, because yeah, I know. <laughs> so the, 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 the a fly reel itself, I'm going to let you into a secret for, you know, all the manufacturers out there touting their fly reel is the best at catching fish and, and everything. You know, it really took me maybe 10 percent of the effort that I put into this thing to make it really good at catching fish. That's not actually that hard. Right. Uh, there's some subtleties in making your drag smooth, but it's really not as complicated and as hard as the real manufacturers would make it out. What's really hard and complicated is to make the thing survive abuse, right? And to just be fished day in and day out. And like, for example, say, say you, say you bass fish, right? There's probably not a single bass you will ever catch in your lifetime that's actually going to take out drag, Right. But as you're fishing through the day and you strip line out and you reel it in and you strip it out and you reel it in, that's what puts abuse on a fly reel. Or you drop it or you slam it in the car door or whatever. Uh, that's the hard part of designing this. And I've been working on it for three years now. 
and I made a bunch of prototypes and gave them to my friends, and they broke it, and they broke it, and they broke it again. And uh, that was the hard part, right? So there was actually a lot of effort into that. And then the other hard part is, is that 3D printing isn't actually a very refined and exact process. There's a lot of variability in it. There's a lot of chaos that goes on. And getting it repeatable to where I can start making them over and over and over again, and they're kind of the same every time, and I can just bolt them together, that's actually been really hard. You know, but kind of fun, too. So <laughs> it's been worth it. <laughs> kind, yeah. of, kind of fun that only an engineer can <laughs> maybe have, right? <laughs> so how much uh how much metal is in them i mean are they do you have any that are salt water reels or right now they all freshwater reels oh they're all salt water so the the main body most of the plastic is petg which is the same thing that water bottles are made out of right and um, that's three quarters of the garbage that's floating in the middle of the ocean and ruining our planet right right uh, so that's obviously that's salt water safe and then most of the uh, metal components there's like three machine components and a bunch of screws, and um, those are all stainless steel, and most of them are 316 stainless, which is pretty saltwater safe. So, no, it, it's designed to be saltwater safe. You still, just like everything else, you got to rinse it in fresh water. Yeah. You know, salt water will get almost anything if you let it, right? But, uh, but no, it's perfectly saltwater safe. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's one of the things. You know, it's not even the salt water, just the air coming in to that area it's you know if you've ever been down by the ocean there's car washes everywhere you right. know, and that's for it's like that for a reason right. but, people's houses that are 100 yards from the beach are falling apart right just right. in the air right yeah yeah because it's just it's it's gnarly and i don't think you know those of us that live in the midwest you know that maybe get to go to the see the ocean once a year i don't think we understand some of the some yeah. of the things that go on there um now with carp fishing, you've been carp fishing for quite a while. You sort of touched on it before the show about how you got into it, but you've been carp fishing a lot longer than the popularity of carp fishing. Yeah, actually, uh, geez, man, I, it's gotta be getting up on 20 years now, I think. Uh, but I, I started carp fishing just a little bit before Barry Reynolds book about carp fishing came out. And, um, I got really started right about that same time. And then his book came out and that helped draw my interest even more but i was kind of there at ground zero and uh and then maybe 15 years ago there started to be a big push on the blog scene where there were five or six of us that were blogging about fly fishing for carp and really started to to drive that community and kind of drive the popularity and i was in on that and it was it was pretty fun. So you, you talked about how you guys feel like there's this wave over the past year of, of popularity of it where you're starting to see it all over the place. There was a similar wave about 10 years ago where it went really zero to 60 in, in just a year. And for like six months, that little group of bloggers, we were kind of the cool guys on the whole fishing internet, right? <laughs> Which is, believe me. Cool is not something you associate with me in any way, shape, or form ever, right? <laughs> so that was kind of a weird and odd sensation. But uh, it, it uh, fly fishing for carp has been a big part of my life and very gratifying. Yes. yes. Yeah, I know, you know, a lot of folks that in the Midwest, you're not catching giant fish all the time, but carp can get, you know, really big. Right. And it's you fish them from what i've seen and what i've done you know it's very similar to redfish the way they feed a lot of times um you know you can catch them you can catch them on top water sometimes with like mulberry flies and whatnot but little shrimp flies i've even seen guys make little corn flies you know it's it seems to be that there's a a whole second secondary set of flies for that i know i've actually got some carp flies here that i've tied up um mm -hmm. getting ready to get out uh, you know before the end of the year before the end of the warm season and get out there and, and catch some adam have you done any carp fishing or have you tried it or have you isolated down where you want to try it out no yeah i haven't done any carp fly fishing at all um certainly something i'd like to do uh i haven't tied any flies that resemble any of that i so it's it's all completely foreign to me i i would certainly be the rookie in uh, out of the group here do you, Trevor, yeah. <laughs> do you tie your own flies when it comes to, 
to carp fly fishing or what, what is your method in terms of, uh, Oh yeah. Uh, matter of fact, I've kind of, I kind of helped. I don't know. I invented a whole new class of carp flies in a way, um, back in the day, but, uh, no, I've got, I, I was, I used to be really into the flies for carp because there was a time that same time period because of the newness and freshness of carp, it was driving some of the innovation in flies for the whole fly fishing community, right? A lot of the new, brighter ideas for flies in that time period were coming out of bass fishing and carp fishing because those were, those were just two new uh, frontiers, kind of, and that was spurring a lot of creativity, right? So um, I'll tell you what, if you want to, my site's still there, flycarpin.com. There's a drop down menu for flies. And there are literally hundreds of recipes for flies on there. We used to have fly swaps every year, and and uh, there's a lot of great information there. But uh, so if if you want to try just kind of the some of what I would recommend is the four or five top flies for you, just to get started. The number one that everybody should know is called the hybrid, and that's uh, by John Montana out in Oregon. And that's a very simple fly. It's just a soft tackle with a red chenille tail basically coming off the back. And uh, that's kind of the Adams or Adams Irresistible, if you will, or the woolly bugger of, of fly fishing for carp. It works almost everywhere. It's kind of a universal pattern. Um, my most famous pattern is the trouser worm, if you want to look that up. That's my most universally used pattern. And that's caught, you know, thousands of carp. Um, it's the, say that again, the trouser what? Trouser worm. Trouser, trouser worm. worm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> As in, eat my trouser worm. <laughs> you get a trouser worm, a zoo cougar, and a sex dungeon going to a bar. <laughs> there you go. It's a common theme there. I, I pretty much, as, as far as I'm concerned, if, uh, if a fly name isn't a little bit dirty, it ain't fun, you know? So... <laughs> That's good. Um, I like that with beer names too. Beer names, yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, craft beers need to have a name that's just a little cantankerous. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's fun, right? You know, uh, who wants yeah. to buy something that just says beer on the side, right? That ain't, that ain't <laughs> exactly. You're not buying that. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah, but so you know, fly fishing for carp. I guess there's kind of a theme there. Is is that one of the things that I love about fly fishing for carp is one of the things I love about 3D printing. It democratizes fishing, right? And um, if if you go on Instagram and you go to my, my 3D fly reels site, what you're going to notice is I don't spend a lot of time focused on highlighting the glory fish, right? And listen, at some point, somebody's going to catch some bone fish on it. Somebody already just lost one just the other day. I'm excited about that kind of stuff, but I'm super excited about all the uh, big mouth buffalo and black drum and garfish and carp and bass and smallmouth bass and all of the kind of brown water or warm water species that people are catching on my reel. Uh, it's really cool because that stuff, it really brings fly fishing to the entire country, you know? And if you're just looking at fly fishing for trout or fly fishing for bonefish or tarpon or permit, you know, you're probably talking about that 5% of the people in the whole country have actual, real, honest-to-goodness, easy access to kind of that, that kind of fishing. Everything else is really kind of those less glorified species that, uh, you know, the warm water stuff, the cool water stuff. Um, and I think it's really good for fly fishing that that's all started to open up and really be part of the vernacular and part of our culture, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, and I I know for a fact whenever I started fly fishing over twenty years ago, um, I thought it was a trout thing, and there were no trout, and I was interested in fly fishing, and I had a professor that fly fished, and he's like, no, you don't need trout. He's like, all you need are you know smallmouth bass, panfish, you know whatever, and I learned to fly fish basically for those warm water species. And then when I went to tie flies, they had a, a class here in town and I thought, well, I'm going to learn how to tie flies, but every fly was a trout fly. And so it's sort of, it was like, okay, I'm going to learn to tie flies, but am I ever going to use any of these? 
Um, and so I wound up putting the fly tying stuff away. And then when I, as I started fishing for bass again, picking it back up and the larger streamers, the bigger baits, the bigger hooks, that was really what I was interested in. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. I, uh, I kind of started warm water when I was in college at the university of Oklahoma and this was in the late nineties. And, um, I started to look around and I missed fishing because I came from Colorado fishing for trout and I started to look into it. And back then there was like one book out there by Dave Whitlock on fly fishing yep. for bass. And, uh, he had a bunch of patterns in there, but if you wanted to actually go fish for him, all you could get in Oklahoma was poppers. That was it. Yep. And that was really, that was really only only option. If you, if you didn't know how to tie and you didn't have your own materials. Um, now you can hop on the internet. And you can find thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of how to catch bass, how to catch carp, how to catch panfish, all kinds of stuff. And go buy dozens and dozens and dozens of fly patterns and minutes if you're willing to just research a little bit. It's pretty cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always wild to me. And I know, Adam, you've had the same thing of the warm water fish. Just how, you know, you can use trout flies or you can make some trout flies you know some of your streamers and things you can just make them larger right you right. know and and it works but the the trout or the 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 uh bass patterns are you know they a couple of the ones i throw i mean you could nearly throw it on an ultralight <laughs> reel because they're so big and bulky you know they look castable i guess is what i'm saying there you go yeah, yeah. so in missouri do you guys get the big gar yes you got the big gar there right Mm -hmm. you take advantage of them at all that looks like fun um i have been too hesitant to take the larger fly rod when i'm fishing for smaller fish mm -hmm. and i really don't want to hook into a big gar with a four weight yeah so right. that's been one of those things where it's like if i know the water is going to be right on the on especially a couple of the rivers that i'm floating and i've floated them before and there haven't been any storms to knock down any logs then i'm start tra starting to target them but as far as saying, okay, well, I know in this stretch of the river for about this quarter mile, I've got a lot of gar. And and that's sort of the way it is. There's about a quarter of a mile that it's just stacked up with the gar. I don't know what it is about what's going on in that particular ecosystem. Um, and the same way with the Buffalo River. Um, we're, but see, that's on the big vacation trip where we're all going down and drinking. And, you know, some of the guys are fishing. It's like, do I really want to take my eight weight again? Because I'm going to be on the kayak um and don't want to lose it and then there's a lot of gar but it's one thing that i'm really looking at for this coming season i was hoping to do it this season but didn't get a chance to I'll tell you uh, what, i do yeah. have my uh fish shanks though that i'm going to use instead of hooks there you go yeah you know, there you go. they're yeah, uh you don't... they're the craziest fish i've ever hooked the ones that i've hooked they just go balls out nuts yeah yeah they're really fun <laughs> tailing yeah. and like tail walking and jumping and they're pretty cool but you've got to be really careful when you handle them though what because of oh, their, yeah. the way their their uh scales are you can cut yourself pretty bad if you don't know what you're doing yeah, <laughs> yeah. and you can't lip them we uh we caught a big one in the missouri marsh the only time i was there my buddy caught a really big one you know probably 45 50 inches something like that yeah. you know and uh the guy he wouldn't even he said, I'm not even going to deal with that fish. And I said, okay, I'm going to land it for you then. And I got over the side of the boat and I just scooped him up, right? Just grabbed him, bear hugged him up onto the boat. And then I went to hand him to my buddy and caught him. And in the transition, the, the fish just went crazy and flopped and just slapped him right across the face. And he had about a two inch cut down his face, you know? Yeah. But you got to be careful with them. They're yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why I'm not too excited about pulling one in the kayak while I've been drinking beer floating down the river. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine what's going to happen if that occurs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I know a lot of guys that have been catching them, and it's, it's really neat. Now, the one thing I wish you could catch on a fly rod, and I've never heard of anybody doing it, is the big head carp. Well, I, I do know a guy who does it, actually. Okay, uh, really? Yeah, so uh, there's a tiny pond in Colorado um, where, amazingly, somebody at some point, probably for 
interested in eating them at some point, planted big head carp illegally. And um, my friend, who's the most stubborn human being in the history of human beings, he decided he wanted to go catch those things. And he spent weeks and weeks and weeks, hour after hour, chasing those fish. And finally, he started catching them on a fairly regular basis. And he would catch them with kind of neutrally buoyant fluff balls or little black leeches that were very neutrally buoyant. And even he wasn't sure whether it was like that this fish is filter feeding and it happens to just filter feed his fly. But he's pretty sure that that fish actually moved on his fly at least a couple of times, right? Yeah. yeah. But they and, are uh, they are really crazy. I've seen some video of them fight. They go just nuts. Last oh, month we oh, had a yeah. kid – uh, he what kid he was 26 or 27 um he and his buddy were bow fishing in a in a in a private lake and how it got there nobody will know but it was a world record 125 pound big head carp wow yeah you know so and the average size that you see in the river you know between 15 and 25 30 pounds i've seen some guys bow fish 40 pounders you know that's a that's a lot of fish and they are already acrobatic anyway. I don't know if you've ever been in a in a boat going over them when they start jumping. You know, they'll course, they'll yeah. knock guys out of a boat. They jump so yeah. hard. Right. Um, but they're an invasive species, and we're trying to cut down on them. And the conservation department's really encouraging bow fishing for them. Um, but if we could find a way to make them catch, you know, fish them with the fly rod, it'd be great. Yeah, I think it's probably not going to happen. I mean, that, like I said, that that particular guy is ridiculously stubborn. Yeah, uh, that's that's you know. One half of 1% of the people are ever going to have enough patience to make that happen. And I think in that whole time, he landed something like five or six fair hooked fish and put yeah. a lot of effort into it. And they were, you know, he was catching 40 to 60 pounders out of this little tiny pond, uh, but uh, a lot of effort to put in. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Just if we can just figure out a way to do that, I think that would be it. You well, know. they're supposed to be delicious. I mean, like really, really tasty. The, yeah. yeah, I've had them. The Department of Conservation puts on uh, two river days, one in the spring and one in the fall, and they put tilapia, catfish, and, uh, and big head carp. They cook them all, and they put them, all three of them on your plate, and you have to guess which one you like the best. And hands down, it turns out to be that that carp. Yep. So, Yeah, he kept yeah. one and, and gave it to a friend who went and cooked it for his family, and this whole family yeah. ate it, and they ate every single ounce of it. And said it was just oh, really? Like, yeah, See, I've heard it's just edible. the back straps. Well, I mean, they, every ounce of the edible stuff. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just that back strap is because have you ever eaten gar? No, no. Okay, a, a, a gar has to be more than you know. It has to be more than three, three and a half foot long. But they have a a tenderloin, or excuse me, a back strap, just like a deer would, <laughs> running from their dorsal fin back down, and that's the that's the edible part of the gar. Is it good? It's not bad. Okay. It's not bad. You know, I mean, there's other fish that I'd rather have, but I wouldn't turn it down. Right. <laughs> it's better than rattlesnake. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know. Have you found yourself uh, traveling all over to target carp in different environments, different states or parts of the world? How, what is how, What's that journey been like for you? Yeah, so I mean, that's what I... You know, a lot of people, they might want to go to the Bahamas or whatever. I'd like to do that someday, too. But mostly I travel for carp. And there's two really kind of – the two glory areas for carp that are kind of legendary are really the Columbia River and the and Lake Michigan. And, and the other Great Lakes are pretty good, too. They just aren't quite as publicized for it. They may even be better in some ways, right? Um, but uh, – you know, I go to those places because you have access to a lot of big carp, and you know, eventually you, you catch a species for a while, and you just want to you want to go up against the biggest and the baddest, and those are the places where you can catch them. So I usually do at least one big travel trip a year to one of those two sites, and every once in a while, twice a year. But uh, yeah. they're both epically big, epic beauty, huge fish. Uh, I don't think I've gone. I don't think I've ever gone to Lake Michigan or the Columbia River without catching at least 21, one 20 pound fish. Yeah. 
You know, what I find interesting, and I, and, you know, you talk to guys that talk about, you know, on the flats for carp and things like that. And, and you see the carp and you sort of cast, you know, sight cast to it. Um, and I know Adam's the same way with the Missouri River. The Mississippi River is literally 15 blocks from my house. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got every river that runs into it and, you know, the diversion channel and these things that they've made. It's all muddy water. Right. But you see, especially under mulberry bushes and when the cottonwoods are down, you'll see a lot of carp come up and feed like that. Is that a viable strategy that you would use if you had really muddy or murky water? Oh, absolutely. And and that might be your best strategy. Um, there's there's a couple of scenarios that you really need to look for, um, particularly in the springtime. If you can start to learn when the, when they spawn in your area, they can come super shallow. So if you can find like it, depending on how muddy it really is, you may have to get all the way to ankle deep. But if you can find ankle or calf deep water that they've driven in, up into, you can usually get a sense for where the fish is in re- even really muddy water, and they can still see your fly. And also, as a bonus, a lot of times that stuff is off the main body of the river. So it, it may be a, right. a different kind of dirty, right? It's probably still dirty because the carp are in there, but it's probably a different kind of dirty. So that's one scenario you probably need to look for. The other one is those kind of top water scenarios. And there's a lot of guys who catch a ton of fish on top water. It's not kind of not my thing. Um, I'd prefer to go find clear water where I can spot them tailing. But if that's what you got and you want to adapt, um, you know, Adams, you know, a size 12 Adams, you'll, you'll catch the heck out of those mm-hmm. fish that are clooping on seeds and everything. You don't have to have a perfect seed imitation. And uh, yeah. The other thing to throw for those fish is a lime green unweighted egg pattern. Just, you know, those half, a half moon egg pattern out of yarn. Yeah. yeah. That, that sinks, yeah. sinks real slow. And it'll, it'll, if you, if you dry cast it a little bit and get it dry, it'll hit the top of the water and it'll float for just a minute. And that might get the fish's attention. And then after that, it starts to sink real slow. And the fish in those top water scenarios will often come over and grab it then to real production. How much does scent play? Because this is what I've heard. I've not targeted carp specifically as much as I need to. How much does scent play into the fly versus like a, a bass or a panfish? Or, I mean, a panfish is going to hit anything that moves, but. You know, is there, is it one of those where you need to, cause I've heard people say, oh, you've got to wash your hands with unscented soap and you got to be careful when you're tying your flies and don't have a cigar within like three days of tying your right. fly under your hook. I mean, I've heard wild stuff. All right. So listen, I don't know where paranoia stops and reality starts, but, uh, uh, I'm pretty paranoid about that stuff. Right. And, <laughs> and I quit chewing six, five, six years ago. And that was part of it, that I didn't want to worry about that anymore. There were much more important reasons, but that was a little tiny bit of it, right? I didn't want to die. That's the one that made you quit. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The hell with health concerns. (laughs) Right. But, um, you know, they are just, by the science, they're way better sniffers. They got way better sniffers than any other fish you're running into except maybe catfish. And uh, so I do things like I don't put any glues on any of my carp flies period and stop i don't use super glue i don't use head cement i don't use anything i just double whip finish every fly um it, you know if you really pay attention you can smell head cement and super glue weeks after you apply it if you open your fly box and i've had it kind of i'm pretty damn positive actually that the super glue has an effect because i've had whole boxes where when i was first learning i would have a box of flies and then i would do a bunch of flies and do super glue on them and then put that in the box with all the other flies, and then they would all smell like super glue. And I would just stop catching fish, right? So, and listen, it's hard to know the difference between, you know, symptoms and, you know, just kind of things that make you paranoid. But I just decided at that point, no super glue, try and keep my fly natural. Um, I don't go quite as crazy as like, you know, trying to stop my fly in the mud or wash my hands in the mud before I go or anything like that. And I catch. I catch a lot of carp, right? I mean, I'm pretty good at this point now. You know, uh, I catch holy heck of a lot of carp compared to people that aren't experienced in it. So I don't think that, that you really have to go that far with the mud and the descenting and everything like that. 
Yeah. Uh, what do you use for scent to attract them? Because I know that's what I'm going to have to do. Do you just dump them in corn or, you know? <laughs> that's cheating, man. That's cheating. <laughs> you know, you haven't seen me fish. If you, want, if you want to do that to start, just to get it going, man. I mean, everybody's got to start somewhere, right? But eventually, if you yeah. started fishing for them and you wanted to really get the full challenge, and you're looking at, yeah. you know, people on the internet that are posting lots of pictures, that overwhelmingly the culture of fly fishing for carp just kind of dictates that that's out of bounds. That's not part of the rule. So there may be some people doing it. You're you're talking to the guy who fishes with like the most competitive people in the world. And I have lied to them and put a power bait worm on and trout fished with my fly rod just so I could catch more. And then bull whipped it off when they came to see what I had. Right. And that's fair because I don't want to be just like, you know, one of the things that I, one of the reasons I started fly fishing for carp is I kind of, the trout snobs drove me crazy. And that's part of what drove me into it. So I don't want to be a carp snob either, right? So listen, man, if you get pleasure out of putting a cricket on your line and going and catching carp, do that or bread or whatever. This is for fun, right? You know, I just, uh, I just like out fishing my friends. Right. Yeah, exactly. And it's a, you know, we're costs. getting out and having fun and drinking beers in your kayak or whatever. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's part of it. Adam, are, I know you've got some friends that you fish with. Are you, uh, are you, are you willing to uh, drop down to that cheater zone with me where it's legal? You know, Sean, I, I don't think that I'll ever stoop to your level, buddy, but I'll always be one ahead. I'll always be one, <laughs> just one level up. So. I, I'm certainly, I'm certainly not opposed to to trying to give myself an edge. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool, man. Oh, man. So with the with the carp, and so we, we've talked sort of about the top water and the and the bottom water or the lower water. The drum, where are you targeting? How are you targeting those? I know when I was catching them, um, there were a lot of drum in uh, the lower mountain fork in Oklahoma that that's a nice river it's got a great diversity it's very healthy and it's got a lot of drum and i was catching them in there when i was fishing for smallies um what are you looking at when you go after drum you know i'm not really much of an expert i've caught them here and there and i've had you know one saltwater trip for drum and just a couple of productive trips in the freshwater uh you know in the freshwater the one the one place i was at this year where we caught a lot of them we were fishing just like smallies no no real difference and having lots of fun so I know that like the big drum on the Great Lakes, there's some guys who have developed their own methods and techniques and uh, they look pretty cool. And there's a, a guy named Dave Hurl on Instagram. Go look up his page and you'll want to go target some drum on the Great Lakes. It's really cool stuff that they do, but I don't, I wouldn't profess to understand what he does. Uh, it looks different for sure. And it looks cool, but, not an expert, you know? Yeah, and drums, you know, drum is considered a trash fish around here. Um, if it comes out of clean water, they actually taste really good. Um, I know a lot of guys, and it. it I, I'm trying to say this as, um, as white trash as possible, considering where I grew up from. I know a lot of guys that eat a lot of carp, and they know how to make it taste good. But it's generally not a fish you, you keep to eat. Um, right. Have you tried any of it? And if you have, have you cooked it a certain way that you like? No, not my thing, man. You know, the uh, I don't I don't eat fish much to begin with, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I did do some research when I had the blog, and I was trying to, uh, I was being weird or whatever. I looked into sushi, carp sushi. If I was gonna, you know, I was thinking maybe I'd cut one open on the bank just for entertainment value. Yeah. And I found out that'll kill you. So don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're not like bowfin, where you can you can do that with a bowfin. You take a lemon, you have to eat them raw. No. Oh. No, carp, you don't want to do that. They've got a parasite that's actually dangerous. So Okay. Yeah, you cook Note to self, yeah. no more eating carp. <laughs> well, you can cook them and it's fine, right? But just don't <laughs> eat sushi style. <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah. you know, that really bums me out that uh, the drum thing with the trash fist thing, because that's the same labor that, the label that the carp have that maybe they're growing out, out of, at least with some of the fly fishing community. Mm-hmm. But that's preposterous, man. Drummer, man, they are great fighters. They are pound for pound. They're up there, man. They'll. I, I think they're way better than smallmouth pound for pound myself. I think they're stronger. I think they're more energetic. Oh yeah. You know. 
Yeah, I was on a yeah, the- I was out on a trip this summer on a guided trip. We were targeting walleye, and um, but we were pulling out drum fish routinely, and we thought we had like massive walleye on the end of our line. We pull them up, and, and it'd be a drum, but it was a heck of a fight the whole way through. It was a blast, right? Yeah, and you were doing that with uh, what Kansas City angling experience? Yeah, Kansas angling experience. Yeah, you got it. Kansas angling. Yeah, Kansas angling experience. And what were you? You guys were. You weren't fly riding it though, were no, you? No, no, we were trolling. Yeah, we were using a. Okay. He had a, a bunch of wild setups, and sometimes we were trolling crankbaits. We did a couple of different things. Um, he's got that leg dialed in though. He put us on him for sure. That was a great time, but we were catching yeah. drum too, and that was always a blast. So, uh, Brian, I mean, he's yeah. guided that lake forever. So pulling up a drum, he was like, ah, "Get it out!" My buddy and I were like, "This is the biggest yeah. fish I've ever caught." <laughs> Yeah. You know, I think it would be if we if we got a charter with him, a guided trip with him when we used our fly rods because he said we could. I think he'd change his mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, on how to do he'll that. He'll do that. Yeah, his thing is he'll put you where the fish are. It's up to you to use your own tackle in that regard, but he'll put you out there for sure. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and and like I say, you know, we use that term trash fish a lot even though they're I, they're not tra- trash fish. A gar, like you were talking about, the way a gar fights, a drum. Uh, I've not caught a buffalo on fly rod. Me neither. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm jonesing about it. That's a that's a bucket list fish for me. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think there. I think we can add as fishermen, and you know, through this podcast that gets millions of downloads a day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's the same, Maybe the same we man can. that cheats at fly fishing because he can't handle the competition. So, yeah, millions. <laughs> millions of downloads. <laughs> well, every t- hey, I'll tell you how we got this to be the number one fishing podcast is I go and I delete every social media link for any other podcast I see. <laughs> um, we're, we're knocking on Joe Rogan numbers right now. That's right. Um, <laughs> but, no, I would love to see these fish get more recognition. And I think that would be really great for the sport and having guys like you and having guys like Dan, you know, and especially, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, talking about how these reels that you're making stand up to these fish is a testament to the reel, but it's also a testament to the fight of the fish. Yeah. And, you know, you notice that like, I'm not going to spend any energy being defensive about whether or not these reels can handle these fish. They can just handle these fish. That's what they were designed for. Right. That's just assumed. Basically, if, if as far as I'm concerned, if you if a reel can't handle these kind of fish, don't sell the thing, right? It's right. not commercially viable, right? Um, but it's, you know, it's really kind of interesting. So caught 21 species so far, or the community has on the reel, right? And only one trout that I know of. That's how much our universe is changing. Literally, The design of this reel, I'm pretty sure that it's caught around 1,200 fish so far. Between all the beta testing and all the people who have owned it, it's at least 1,200 fish. As far as I can tell, it has caught one trout. That's inconceivable 20 years ago. That's just, that doesn't even compute. It doesn't make any sense, right? So our world really has changed and it's changed for the better. Um, I remember the first time I ever went to like a, a fly fishing club event. It was maybe one or two years into being excited about fly fishing for carp. And I go to the event and I start to just talk to people and they start to ask me what I do. And I start to talk about it and it was just, it was inconceivable to them. It didn't, it didn't even make any sense. I couldn't, we couldn't even have viable conversations, right? Cause we get to the point where I say, yeah, I fly fish for carp and they, they didn't even know how to respond. Right. But you go to a, if you go to a, you know, some kind of a club event now and you start talking about that, about three quarters of the people are going to know what you're talking about, you know, and some of them are going to be kind of geeked out about it. Interesting. So a whole different world. Yeah. Yeah, You're going to have a handful of them that are going to geek out about it, like you said. And then you're going to have probably the other half of them say, yeah, that's on my list. Like, that's what I really want to target. I just can't imagine many more people like confused by that statement. That's how far I think it's come. Right. And, you know, the, the, the quarter of that group that's going to, you know, scoff at you and call it a trash fish, well, it's just not worth worrying about. Right. They, they got right. their own opinions. You're not going to change them. I don't argue with anybody about this stuff. It ain't, it ain't worth anybody's time or energy to argue about it. 
just move on to somebody else who's a little open, more open-minded. Yeah. Yeah. And that term trash fish, I have to say every time I've heard it, it's always referred to a fish. That's not something you eat on a regular basis. That's right. Basically the whole trash fish thing was defined by our grandparents stomachs. That's right. what defined trash fish and not trash fish. And the really only exception was bass. And they were kind of defined by the bass. They, they were exempted because of the bass fishing circuit. Everything right. else you can just catalog it. Did my grandpa like eating that? Yes. That's a noble species. Did my grandpa right. not like eating that? Trash fish. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and this is the interesting thing. If we as fly fishermen turn and start targeting gar and spending money fishing for gar, start targeting bass, start targeting drums, start targeting buffalo, if we turn these into game fish, how is that going to impact regulations for bow fishing and other things? I mean, if you wind up having, you know, you can come down to Southeast Missouri and you can get on Apple Creek by the boat ramp and you can run up through there and you've got a lot of murky, muddy Mississippi water and you've got really big carp and really big gar. Mm -hmm. Now, if you start seeing an influx of people into that area and money starts being generated, is the state of Missouri going to sit back and say, now we need to redefine how we treat these fish? If you want to bow fish, just bow fish for big head carp, because they are a, you know, a foreign species, an invasive species, a very invasive species. I think, I think that's our job to communicate with our conservation, no matter what state you live in, about needing to protect and watch some of these fish. And I've bow fished before. I've got no problem with bow fishing. If that's what you want to do and you're going to take care of it and do things the right way, especially if you're going after the big head carp, please sure. bow fish for them. Please, 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 please. They're, they're a bad fish to have around, but I think it's up to us to make that change as fishermen. Yeah. And there's been some success about that with that. Some of the, the European style carp fishermen, the bait guys, um, they're maybe a little bit more activist oriented than the fly guys. The fly guys just kind of do their thing to a certain degree, but they've, they've fought some battles across the country on a couple key lakes that are kind of super trophy lakes where they've won and they've gotten bow fishing prohibited on those lakes. It hasn't always worked out. Um, some of the ones down in Texas, the bow fishermen kind of ignore the rules. I'm pretty sure, but uh, there have been some successes there and I'd like to see more. I, you know, I don't think yeah. that yeah. bow fishing is a sport. I think it's murdering for fun, just just killing for fun. I don't think it serves any yeah. purpose. It's not like it's not like deer hunting where you're where you're hunting for meat and there's a connection to to the to your your history and your culture of of hunting for meat. Um, I think that's a lot different. Um, yeah. and it's also a lot harder and it's a lot more sportsman. There ain't nothing hard about shooting carp, man. I mean. Trust me, doing what I do right. and as good as I've gotten at fishing for carp, it's per, it would be preposterously easy for me to go out and shoot carp with a bow. It's yeah, it's yeah. it's it's not challenging. I think I think the big head carp are definitely, you know, with because they're I don't know have they made it in the Great Lakes yet, or did know. that barrier they put up stop them? I uh, knew there was a barrier they put up yeah. that they tried to stop them, but that. If they get into the Great Lakes, that's going to be devastating because they have they've really torn up the population of different fish here in in Missouri, um, just because of the rivers that on my side of the state that feed directly into the Mississippi that they come back up. Yeah. Um, so you know, they're 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 bad news. Yeah. Um, there's actually a place in Kentucky that uh, last I heard they were trying to commercially fish for them to make them into into dog food. Yeah. So maybe that'll work out. Sure. Um, so hopefully, yeah. um, we. Go ahead. And, you know, look, I, for me, there is a line between those big head carp and the common carp, but I'm not even sure I can defend that line beyond that. I think we've all established that the common carp have value as a game fish. Right. Species over the past 20 years. And the, the, the big head cat, the big head carp, there, there's no value as a, as a game species. There really isn't as far right. as I can tell. You know, so that, yeah. so that's, there's my opinions probably a little bit self-serving there as to where I draw the line, but. I don't think common carp are nearly as damaging either. I think they're way overblown how damaging they are. 
No. Yeah. And, and it is funny. Have you ever, if you, and I'm sure you have how common carp and grass carp got into the United States. Bumper. That's yeah. 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 And, and because of, they were considered a delicacy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's funny how, what was the King's fish we now, people now refer to as a trash fish, right. you know? Yeah. That is that the irony of that is, is so rich. Um, we've got five, 10 minutes left. Um, go ahead and let us know how to find you on social medias. Um, talk to us a little bit more about the website with the, with your reels. I know you've got extra spools. Um, can you talk us through some of the weights and you said you normally drop new reels every week or so, um, because they sell out really fast. Can you talk us through some of that real quick? Yeah, we, we've had fun talking about fishing, not much about the product, which is more fun, actually. So, um, first of all, really the place to find me is on Instagram, 3D Fly Reels on Instagram. That's where I'm putting all of the energy in terms of flowing information out. The website is just a place where people can go order. I'm not blogging there or really putting much value into that. Um, but so far, I've sold right around 40 reels, uh, started this spring, and I'm making right around three to five a week right now. And um, I can't keep up so far. I've, I've sold every one of them quickly. And right now, about every weekend, I'm announcing on my on my uh, Instagram that I've got a new batch available. And I'm putting it out in batches. And that's just to keep me from getting overwhelmed. I'm pretty sure that if I just opened it up and said, hey, free for all, everybody buy as many as you want. I wouldn't have a life, right? And I've got a day job and everything. I've got a family and they actually like to see me sometimes. So the batches is just a way to kind of throttle down just a little bit. And I've got the tiger by the tail and try and survive that experience, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the price is great um, because I don't, I haven't had to do a lot of a massive investment up front. Um, and I don't have a lot of overhead. I don't have employees or anything like that. I've managed to keep the price really reasonable. It's $160 for a reel and $40 for a spool. You can't find anywhere where you can get a, a good quality reel with a spool for 40 bucks. You know, and a, yeah. a nice, real good cork disc drag for 160 right? Um, it comes in a lot of crazy, cool, fun colors. It's a totally functional reel. I mean, the guy just caught a 30-pound black drum on it yesterday, right? Nice. It's not a toy. It's not a toy in any way, shape, or form. It's not junk plastic. It's very carefully designed. Um, and uh, the price is really good. And yet again, that's part of trying to democratize fly fishing, right? Uh, yeah, I think the burgundy is extremely, is an extremely cool color. Yeah, it's the one I got right here. Yeah, I'm sitting here looking at your, at your yeah. yeah, I'm sitting here looking at your site and I'm thinking, how do I color coordinate with which rod? What do I need? <laughs> That's the only problem with the burgundy. On its own, the burgundy is the prettiest color. Yeah. It may not go with a lot of rods that are out there right now. It may not match naturally. Right. You know, I got all kinds of crazy colors. We've got a, a, a neon green. We've got pink. We've got combinations of neon green and pink. We've got more normal muted colors like gray and kind of tactical army colors. And mm -hmm. So and, you know, kind of maybe leave it here. That's really my business model eventually that I'm working up to is, is something called mass customization. So right now you got a couple of real companies that will customize reels for you. You got Able, and that's going to cost you an arm and a leg. You got maybe Taylor and yeah. got a couple of different options. That costs you an arm and a leg. Really for me with the 3D printing, it's barely more expensive for me to do some crazy color combination as it is to do just black, right? I'm charging a little bit more money, but not, nothing like Abel's charging for customization. So long term, my picture is, is that you get on the site and you build your reel, right? And you start with a base reel and then you build whatever crazy color combination you want. And then you add a sealed handle and you add a super uh, large arbor spool or you add a soft water safe feature or you add some engraving on the backside or something like that but where that's starting right now is is that right now you can order up to ten thousand different color combinations already on my website and basically the reason i can do that is you make the order i make the parts right, right. i'm not carrying a big backlog a big inventory of parts i'm just going to make whatever you order which means that i can customize it kind of like the 
you know, it's kind of the uh, the fiberglass rod thing with the, with all the fiberglass rod makers out there right now, where you can get. I didn't really understand this a couple of years ago. You can get really awesome customized fiberglass rods for way cheaper than top end, yep. uh, you know, sage store bought rods, and just have yep. something that is absolutely just for you for three quarters of the price. Really, yep. I'm kind of doing the same thing. Pablo down at Bajuco Flats. I mean, you know, you can order a blank in, you know, damn near any color and color coordinate the reel with it, you know, and that's, you know, you got a custom reel and a custom rod and you're, you're in it for sub $300. You know what I mean? I'm already starting two collaborations with two different rod manufacturers. Yep. One's making me a, uh, a custom rod to match a, a custom color combination right now that we're playing with. And then another guy is, uh, and this will be on my Instagram eventually when it comes out, we're making a, uh, 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 we're making a pink combination with a pink reel and a pink rod custom rod for uh, uh breast cancer awareness mm-hmm. that we're gonna that we're gonna donate to a, a tournament and they're gonna auction it off so i sent right. him a, i sent him a pink reel and he's matching the color and patterns a little bit that's so, awesome uh, yeah that so is all awesome yeah. There. Yeah. yeah yeah adam what all you got left up i i talked i talked a little bit less tonight uh <laughs> yeah no, you're good, man. I this has been really great. Like I said, I'm I'm novice when it comes to carp fishing, so I've got a lot of stuff. I I was taking notes on my phone, a lot of the stuff that you were saying, Trevor. And then I've been perusing on your Instagram. I these like you said, these color combos are freaking awesome. So I'm gonna have to yeah. uh, plug in and see if I can get a hold of one of these one of these next batches you've got going. This has been awesome. It's been I've got a ton yeah. of takeaways. So really enjoyed having you on here, man. That it's, it's been pretty fun. Yeah, pretty cool. Thanks for yeah. the conversation. It was fun to kind of branch out and not just – I didn't really want to just talk about the reels, right? That's not fun well, for an yeah. hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what – I always think it's neat to find people that are innovative, but then we always wind up talking about fishing. So, well, you know. us all together, right? That's the glue. That's what we all – Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like we we want to give you you know you're you're nice enough to donate an hour of your time to us to come on our show to make it better because God knows they don't listen for Adam and I, um, <clears throat> which explains the number of downloads from last week's episode. Adam, we got to talk <laughs> yeah. about that. True. Um, <laughs> but it, it's it's you know that's it's not all about that. It's about the the community afterwards. So we like to give you guys some time to talk about that and then and then have the show and and Trevor, you're welcome back anytime you want to come back on, man. Um maybe we can get Dan on and and we can all sit around and we can, you know, really go over carp fishing, you know, again in depth here in a couple of months. Um I'm guessing carp fishing is not great in the winter time. Wrong. Wrong. Yeah. Absolutely. So um you got a few more minutes or are you done? Yeah. Well, we got all, well, I, we don't have a time limit. That's the beautiful well, thing about, as long as we've got beer, we do not have well, a time well, limit. So I went five years straight catching a carp every month for five years straight when I lived in Colorado. So here's the deal. Um, in rivers, if there's moving water, if the carp wants to live, the carp has to eat. Right. right, especially smaller rivers um, where they can't find a spot where they can just go to the bottom and just sit and basically hibernate. They got to eat through the winter. So if you have access to a a, a, a small river, um, you know something that you know you can kind of throw a rock across, maybe that kind of size, and that you can. I know one river. right now. <laughs> Those fish eat in the winter. Period. End of story. And as a matter of fact, if you can find a day where there are, pay attention to the overnight lows. If you get overnight lows of 50 degrees or better, which happens almost everywhere, at least a couple of times in the winter, maybe not like North Dakota everywhere, but everywhere in your latitude. Um, and then it's 70 degrees the next day. That will be the best day of your year to fly fishing for carp because their metabolism just goes absolutely crazy. And it can be a lot of fun. And because they're hungry and there's not a lot of food, you can really have some really fun, great days, you know? Um, other places where you have access to them is um, anywhere where you've got warm water springs dumping into mm-hmm. ponds and lakes. Um, they will congregate there, maybe not quite all year, but pretty close. At your latitude, they'll probably congregate there all year. 
Um, yeah. There's guys up in Utah and, and Idaho who catch them three quarters of the year in, in hot water spring areas, right? Um, but no, it can it can really be a lot of fun in the winter, actually, and pretty gratifying because it's a way to just keep the keep the the cabin fever out, you know. Yeah, yeah, we. I don't, Adam and I both are cabin fever because it seems like bass fishing really slows down a lot unless you get a couple of warm days in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Missouri Department of Conservation throws trout into ponds here. And, you know, it's like, that's, you know, all you've really got. And so now I'm, I'm really excited because I, I have a, I have a, a river about, oh, oh, it's a creek. It's what it is. And it's about a mile and a half from where I work. So I will be out after school this winter. 100% positive you can catch, catch carp in that creek in the winter. Keep in that creek yep. in the winter. Guarantee you, right? Um, and, yep. you know, the trout stuff in the winter, that's a good, uh, you know, that, that that's fun. But you can get some big fish if you if you go learn the carp and really put some time into it. You have to slow down your presentation a little bit. They, they're not going to chase down a fly. They want their presentations to be really still and slow moving. Um, I tend to do the best with kind of black leech patterns in the wintertime and I tell mm-hmm. myself because that's because leeches are always available in the water that maybe me fooling mm-hmm. myself, you know, telling myself lies, but that's something to think about. You know what? Do me a favor because, uh, one of my friends loves the black leeches for trout and I've been using uh, fly tires, dungeon MS bugger dubbing in black. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a, uh, uh, just a dubbing, but it's got rubber legs and it's got some, uh, what you would consider to be a flashy dubbing in with it too. It's a nice mixture. And I just, all right. A very subtle flash, right? Yeah. Very subtle. It's, it's a black flash. It's just, it's just a shiny black. And I've been wrapping that up with a black bead head and you know, they're on whatever size hook you want to. And I've been fishing those and I've had great luck when I was catching trout this year in Cotter, I was basically using those, um, in a Brown and olive um but i i think if you if i'd like for you to look at that material and see what you think about that for carp flies uh, uh, you've said enough i can tell you that it's very similar to the pat cohen um what's it called uh pat cohen's something midnight that i use for actually my second most productive fly which is called yeah. a chubby chaser leech similar yeah. kind of stuff it's got some some rubber legs in it a real subtle black uh, uh, flash to it and then kind of a little bit more of a coarse i'm guessing dubbing mm-hmm. right so probably yeah. some other stuff and i've caught 400 carp on that fly something like that yeah. so i'm pretty sure yeah. that fly will work for you yeah when you say leech this that that's just the the, the e- it's the easiest fly in the world to tie right yeah <laughs> i mean you yeah, make you a dubbing a little shorter um dub- yeah keep it down to like an inch long for carp yeah inch and a half. yeah yeah, I mine are all uh, half uh, a quarter of an inch to an inch, or three quarters of an inch to an inch. Perfect. They're really small. I put a bead head on some of them to get them down faster. Black bead head, and boom, you're done. Good. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. You'll catch yeah. lots of carp on that. That's a great fly. Cool. Uh, those are cool. also uh, great. That's an also unweighted. That's a great fly for those top water carp that you're talking about. Cool. You keep that in the top third of the column, and then you give it a, a real steady strip. Carp don't like erratic things, right? So don't give it that little short erratic strip. Do right. like a long, slow draw past the carp, and they'll move over and grab that fly a lot. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think we all learned something tonight. Yeah, no doubt. You bet. Yeah. Well, Trevor, we're going to talk to you. You know, uh, we're going to get that kayak flyer logo to uh, customized reel that, you know, we get an extra, you know, $300 off the sale price for. You so know, wait, because those, those things will be you 160 bucks. Damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got a fun They'll be flying off buddy. the shelf. <laughs> yeah. They'll be like 22 ammunition. You won't be able to keep them in stock. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this is Sean. Uh, hopefully, Adam will be back with us next week. I want to thank Trevor again. Head over to 3dflyreels.com. And check these out. Like I said, he's not putting out a lot of weeks, so you need to be ready and follow him, him on Instagram at 3dflyreels.com. Reach out, let him know if you've got a wild color, and hopefully he can work you in. Man, this has been awesome, and we will be back next week. I think we have a guest next week. 
Maybe. Everybody, yeah, everybody <laughs> just sort of stops and smiles. <laughs> I think we've got a guest next. I've got to look at my calendar and see who we've got. I know we've got some set up for later in the month. But anyway, guys, thanks a lot. We'll talk to you guys next time.